Hello, St. Louis, and welcome to the STL Leaders Podcast, hosted by Brian Bisking. Brian started this weekly podcast to give a voice to leaders of our community, to share their story, their journey, and the lessons that they have learned along the way. Brian grew up in a small town outside of St. Louis, where he watched his father run a small business and was always interested in how the leaders in his community got where they are. Whether it's a local business leader, a philanthropist, or a celebrity, these are your STL leaders. Join us today, where we will chat with another pillar of our community on this week's episode of the STL Leaders Podcast. And now, your host, Brian Bisking. Hello, St. Louis, and welcome to this week's episode of the STL Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Bisking, and on this week's episode, we welcome Jalen Bletso to the show. Before we get to this week's episode, I want to thank my two sponsors. First, Synchrony HR and NWO IT Services. And now to this week's episode with Jalen Bletso. <music> Jalen Blutso, welcome to the STL Leaders Podcast. I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you for having me, Brian. Excited to be here with you. Absolutely. Well, we uh, we got connected on LinkedIn, of all places, uh, and had uh, coffee a few, uh, I guess, about a month ago and really was, um, I don't even know the right word for it. I was talking to my dad last night. I was telling him that I was going to do this episode today, and your story was uh, really just incredible on how you got started in the business that you're in at such a young age. And obviously we're going to get into all of that, but uh, my dad was like, yeah, that sounds like a great story. I'm excited to listen to that episode. So here we are um, and get started, you know, tell me, you know, let's, for those obviously who don't know, talk to me a little bit about starting your company and how that happened. Absolutely. So some context today, uh, I have a lot of roles, but my primary two roles are the chair is the chairman of the Bledsoe Collective and the managing director of Flair Partners. So take you back 11, 12, 13 years, I started a company called Bledsoe Technologies LLC out of this desire to learn how to program and build websites, which ultimately became a tech consulting firm that grew fairly fast. Yeah, it did. <laughs> Yeah, I think it, it was in about a year and a half to two years, we hit about 3.5 million in revenue. So it was like rapid fire. And I learned a lot by jumping into the fire on how to scale and replace yourself and how to deal with chaos uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So tell talk to us, you started that at what, what age were you when you started that company? Yeah, so I started the company at 11. Um, and it gives some context, you know, on my upbringing, I was born to two single uh, or two high school parents. Grew up in a single household for the first 13 years of my life. And I got tired of hearing no to my king size snicker as a <laughs> chubby kid. And so however I could find ways to make money, I had that like that uh, skill, that gifting, or that just that desire and that hunger. I remember there was a, a time, Brian, when I was in, I think it was third grade, and I wanted this camera. Uh, and my godfather said, hey, if you can get half the money for the camera, I'll give you the other half. And I think it was like, I need it $600 total. So I went out and cut grass, again, a chubby kid, cut grass one time and realized it was not for me as a chubby <laughs> kid in the summer of St. Louis. And so I got my friends and they were to cut grass for me. And that summer made a couple thousand, few thousand dollars um, and went back to my godfather and said, hey, you said you would match half whatever I made as a count, as a count now. But no, that's just been one of the luxuries I had as a kid was to you know, chase this hunger with finding ways to create something that could go beyond me and I could replace myself in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's what's so incredible is right starting that at such a young age, uh, obviously, and then growing the business as fast as it did to a three point five million dollars in just as you said a year or two. Uh, what's the business at today? Yep. So today we'll do top line about eighteen million um, throughout the organization, um, and that's everything from our investment portfolio to our day to day consulting. And we've even had a chance to, da to dabble in some real estate over the last few years. That's pretty cool. So let's talk a little bit more about the organization itself. Tell us what you guys do for those who don't know. Absolutely. So if I zone in on Flare Partners, which is my day-to-day, -day, that's the one I have all the t-shirts and jackets for. Uh, Flare Partners is a consulting advisory firm for organizations and executives. Uh, we span across three different service lines, uh, one being digital technology and analytics, secondly being marketing communications, and thirdly being operations 
uh, management operations. Uh, each of those have kind of become these organizations that have grown from identifying a client need. And so at first it was tech. Clients expressed a need around some marketing. We built out marketing for one client, then grew more clients in that space. And the same thing for operations. We saw some of our clients who we could drive the front door for, but they couldn't manage the back end of uh, that team and uh, scalability. And so we began to help clients in that space. And so now we're waiting on a fourth area, waiting to see what clients have uh, as a challenge to create that fourth portion of the business. Yeah, pretty cool how the organization has expanded over the, obviously, you know, lifetime of the business. Um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, being a, a young kid still in school. How did you start the business? What were some of those challenges that you were faced with as a, as a young kid, you know, starting a business and then it, it growing as fast as it did? Absolutely. So I think, A, one of the benefits of this uh, era of the world that we're in is technology allows us to create things that is beyond our front yard, or our backyard. So I can create this thing that can go beyond what's happening in St. Louis, but also it can go to a place where no one has to know what my age is unless I express that and make that a part of the story. And so uh, early on, again, started by teaching myself to program. I learned, I think it was seven languages out of 10 books over four weeks over the summer. Uh, beginning to build websites for family and friends for free. Everyone got a website. I was like, Oprah, you get a website, you get a website, you get a website. <laughs> and um, decided, you know, people started offering to pay me, you know, for the websites. Or it was like, hey, I'm at my school I'm, and I'm managing my teacher's computers and they're paying me a fee because the IT department isn't big enough to manage their computers. So that was a this context of age and where I was at in middle school. Within that, uh, I went to create the company illegally as a, a businessman's IT solution, and I did it as a sole proprietorship, you know, for seven dollars on the SOS's website, and went to a bank to get an account open. I had some money in the in the bank. I'm sitting there for two hours. I've also always had a facial hair. I've always had a receding hairline, <laughs> and um, at the end of two hours, we've done all the paperwork. I've put money up for a deposit. For some reason, out of order, he asked for my ID at the very end. And so I give him my middle school ID and he looks at me. I look at him, looking at me, looking at him. And he says, got in my office, you wasted two hours of my time. We'll, we'll send you a check for what you deposited today. And it was this devastating moment um, just to, to have invested time, to have thinking you master what you needed to get done from your internet research. And then to be told, yeah, it's not sufficient. You're not old enough. And then of course, for me at that point in my life, my mom was like, if I get a business, does that impact like what I qualify for in terms of support to like actually manage the household? And so I didn't have that luxury at the time. Uh, but the outcome to that, the win, Brian, was I went home, devastated, but I Googled St. Louis's best business attorney, found one, called him. His name was Paul Hales and said, hey, Paul, I'm 11 years old. I have a vision for a business. Can you help me out? But by the way, I can't afford you. And he said, I feel something is there about you. You're, you're driven. You made this phone call. So something must be going on. So come to my office on Saturday and we'll see what you can do. So I had my grandfather take me to his office. He sat there and he said, I'm going to help you out. If you can manage a computer and a printer in my office, I'll do all your legal work for free. And so we met for a year every Saturday and he helped me build the legal documents, helped me you know, get my godfather on board as the an owner, as well as my dad for you know, 18 year old adult purposes. Um, and the most important part was he he taught me business law and business tort over that year. So like I learned a true understanding of the fundamentals of how to manage the law and legal aspects of, of the organization. Well, there's so many incredible tidbits than just that answer that you just gave me. Um, and I'd be reminisced if I didn't go back to some of them first. Uh, I love how even at 11 years old, you weren't going to let anything stop you, right? 11 years old, you were like, look, I'm going to the bank. You didn't even care about your age. It wasn't, you know, to you and, and probably still today, it's not, it has nothing to do with age, right? It's all about just the drive and the passion that you have uh, for what you do. And then having the the mindset at 11 years old to figure out, okay, I need a business attorney to help me with this and have the wherewithal to even call one and say, hey, can you help me? And by the way, I can't pay you, but I will work it off, so to speak. Um, it's just really incredible. I mean, just I mean, I, I don't even remember what I was doing at 11 years old, but I probably was playing like T-ball or Little League or something and not even <laughs> thinking about business. So just an incredible story uh, of how your perseverance and just your drive and your passion for what you wanted to do, uh, there was no limits. It, what, nothing was going to hold you back. And I pr would assume that's why you're so successful today is just that that drive, that motivation, that passion um, for 
uh, helping companies and helping clients in the technology space. I think uh, just remarkable. You know, I think, and that's what I've learned um, in this in this journey. It's something about that hunger, which I always go back to. Like, if I ever feel like I'm being lazy, I go back to that place of being hungry as a kid. And and let me be clear, I was not starving in terms of actual food. I don't want my sure. mom to be like, Jalen, we were not that poor. We were poor, but not that poor. <laughs> um, but it was a hunger of like, I need to be out of this. And, you know, as an entrepreneur and as an executive, sometimes we do grow and we're like, okay, great. Our bills are paid. There's money in the bank. Let me get comfortable. But I think going back to that, you know, one of those lessons of that journey was if I'm hungry and I work like I'm hungry, then what's ahead of me is is limitless. And I think that's the most important thing I can pick up out of that experience. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me ask you a question that um, we did not discuss prior to this, but it has me thinking about something. So mm-hmm. um, for those who can't see you, you're an African-American male, um, you know, being an African-American male living in a, a household where, you know, sounds like your mom and dad were working as hard as they could and, and to, you know, provide for you and, and your family. Um, and you obviously have a drive and a hunger that has propelled you to where you are today. Uh, but I would say, you know, you know, I'm not ignorant to know that uh, certain communities in the African-American community uh, are usually, I don't know how to properly word this, but, uh, you know, they're not given... I shouldn't say not given the same opportunities as others, but they're not, sometimes it's harder for them to come out of the environment or the household or neighborhood or, or whatever. And you can probably articulate this way, way better than me. Um, but I guess where I'm going with this, Jalen, is how as United States citizens, how as citizens of St. Louis, how as St. Charles County resident, how, how do we help um, children like you have that drive, have that passion, but need the chance to to utilize that drive, that passion um, to propel them for success in the future as well, other than just saying, you know, well, just we can't help. Like, how do we help in those particular instances? Because, and again, you, you've lived this, you've grown up this, and I'm not articulating this well at all, but I'm trying to, you know, just try to get a conversation going about right. how you were able to do that. And how do, how do we uh, help others do that? Absolutely. You know, if I take a step back and I look at my story as a part of the answer, I can walk through milestones and and, and that'll help. When I look at a black kid, teenage parents living in a single household with your mother, that right there is the the expectation. Um, And the outcome of that is I saw what my mom did. You know, she went to college, never graduated. She's worked a great career and she's building something, you know, she's built something great in, in her in her life. But the expectation would have been that I would have been just like her or or worse because of what I did not have. Correct. Now, what I was blessed with, and I I call it a blessing, I call it luck, and then I pair that with whatever the skill that the skill that I had individually or whatever I got out of my books or out of whatever I I gained and developed myself was my grandparents early on, you know, said, Hey, you know, obviously. Our, our daughter had a kid young. Um, he has cousins that are his age that live in Lake St. Louis and he lives in North County. And his and her parents are going to give her a life that his parents can't. And so we can't give him exactly what she has, but what of what they're doing or what she's doing, can we bring to him? And so she went to swimming lessons that summer. My grandparents like, we're going to find you a swimming camp soon and nearby and you're going to swim camp soon. And so that summer for two years, I went to swim camp. Um, If she was learning piano, you know, and I I happened to touch the piano and hit two buttons right. I was in piano lessons for six or seven years being classically trained. This is second grade, Brian. Like I was in piano. I was, I joined the middle school band and elementary school band a year early because of how important it was for my grandparents to be, to be sure that I had the same experiences. Jump forward. Um, you know, in third grade or I think it was third grade, I was in, entered into the gifted education program at Hazelwood School District uh, called Galactic. So a teacher identified an opportunity to say, hey, you know, we see there's something here. Let's get them tested for I, uh, IQ test it. And then out of that, going to more advanced classes uh, once a week as a part of that program. Jump forward to middle school. And in middle school, um, I wanted to be a part of the PTSA of the school. Um, and the principal knew that PTSA ended you know, it might, it might start at three, it might end at 4.30 or five. And she knew that my mom 
could not pick me up at that point or after the buses that ran. And so she offered to take me back home after every PTSA meeting so I could, I could be the student vice president of that, of that organization and would get me home. That same principal, when my mom had another child, um, knew that there was a general need and she hosted a baby shower at the school of the teachers to give my mom supplies for that for that kid wow. that she was having. So there's all these moments, you know, again, going back to the attorney, hey, I'm Jalen, I have a dream for a business, I can't afford you, can you help me out? Okay, great, I'm gonna help you out with, with, with what you need legally, but I'm also gonna teach you the business law, business tort, contract law in the state of Missouri so you don't have to depend on me or someone else every time you need a, a organization filed or need to file documents to the state. So throughout this journey, if I can look at, okay, great, Maybe I was the kid that was a little bit louder about I have a dream and I have goals and I'm pursuing something more advanced. But throughout that process, there was always someone saying, hey, how can I support you? I see a need. Here's what I'm going to support. And so I think the lesson in that for someone who's listening is we have the responsibility to find the Jalen in the class, is to find the Jalen at the local nonprofit and understand how can I utilize what I have as experience, as resource to support that, this person? You know, for me, Brian, it wasn't someone giving me money. I didn't get a check for a million dollars. I didn't get right. a check for $10,000. It was, hey, I have time, I have a vehicle, I have a network, I have experience, and how can I lend that to you in this moment? And so we have that responsibility to be a mentor, to be an advisor, um, to, to help shape the next generation, um, especially those who don't have this access on an ongoing basis. You know, I, I laugh. I went to MICDS for my, my freshman year of high school. And I look at the network that a lot of my peers had by nature of having been at the school for their entire life or having family who was legacy at the school or just the network of who their parents knew. And that's a leg up for every one of those students who had that access. Um, sure. And for me, I had to work a little bit harder to find that or someone had to go a little bit harder to find me to offer me that support. And I think that's what we have to do as those who have built our networks as adults. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um... And that's kind of why I brought this up. You know, when I, I used to, I used to live in a little town, well, not so little anymore, but a town called Edwardsville, Illinois, for those who know where Edwardsville, mm-hmm. Illinois is at. And I was a member of a, a church there called Metro Community Church. And uh, a good friend of mine, his name's Brent Freeman, uh, and another gentleman by the name of Seth Redman, we, we volunteered through the church to go down to JJK Center, Jackie Joyner Kersey Center in East St. Louis one summer um, to coach basically Corey league baseball. Um, and three of us one, you know, we, we coached a team of, I think it was, they were seventh graders for an entire season. And when we got down there, they had, you know, they didn't really, um, know why these, you know, put to put a blank, these three white guys or in East St. Louis coaching Corey league baseball to seventh graders, you know, we would, we, when we started the season, there wasn't a whole lot of what I would call respect or appreciation even for what we were doing. Um, and obviously we, we, talked a lot about our faith in God and Christ uh, to these children as well. And most of the kids did had no clue who Christ was or who Jesus was. And by the end of the season, I will tell you, it was probably one of the most rewarding things for me. Uh, At the end of that that season, these kids had the most respect. They were so polite. They were so appreciative. They were asking to pray. They were talking about their faith. Um, And I tell people all the time, look, you know, at that time I was, I don't even remember how old I was. I was mid twenties. I had time, right? I didn't have any money, but I had time. Um, And, you know, it was for me, some of the most rewarding time of my life, being able to impact the future lives of young children, no matter if they're white, black, purple, green, orange, I don't really care what color they are, but if I can spread the word of Jesus, um, and as well as just help them in their future life, then I'm all on board. And so I think to your point, we as, you know, Americans or St. Louisians or whatever you want to call us, <laughs> if we can be more like that, more where, you know, we take, you know, a little time every once in a while and help somebody out, even if you're, you know, a CEO listening to this episode or a CFO or something along those lines, there's probably somebody in your organization you can mentor, right? There's probably somebody out there who's not in your organization who's looking for a mentor who could use some help and advice and guidance. And I think we should all try to take some time out of our day uh, and try to support somebody else. And it doesn't matter who that is or what color they are or what background they're from or what country they're from. Um, if we can just be better humans, I think it not only is more rewarding for us, but also can really propel somebody in their future. 
No, that's that's so important. And I think we have the conversation. It's really, it's a part of our responsibility across the board. Um, one of the, or, the orgs I serve on the board for, we're launching a, a young professionals network. And we built this, this charter you know, at first it was like, what can the, the organization learn from these young, young professionals, which is great. What can we gain from them? But one of my biggest, you know, mandates was, but what can we give back to them? You know, if our board is a bunch of 50, 60, 70 year old executives or retired executives in St. Louis and beyond, yes, we can gain the experience of a, a millennial to help advise and, and strategize, but also these millennials are working at your companies. These millennials are shaping your companies and they have career goals and how do we support them? And I think honestly, that solves a big problem when it comes to the idea of, you know, millennial retention. Yes. If, a, if a millennial or a Gen Z sees that their leader is supporting them individually and cares about their goals and cares about their development path, I think that challenge of them only staying two years could be a five or six year, um, you know, term. So that's great uh, that you mentioned yeah. that. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's uh, shift back to to the business piece of 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 you, and let's talk a little bit about you know clients. And I, I know obviously more than our listeners, but you have clients all over the country, right? So, mm -hmm. how do you find your clients? How do you navigate that world from a technology space? Absolutely. So, when it comes to finding clients, we're actually in the middle of this exercise right now um, on identifying what is the right engine to turn on client development versus otherwise. So, for the last you know, since 2012, as an organization, you know, we've had the, the luxury of finding all of our clients via referral. Wow. You can work with the client, they're excited, they pat, they make a referral to another executive that they know, and that's how we've grown. Every single client, we, we had never, up until 2023, maybe 2022, we had never went out and did outbound work to find, to find customers. And I think that speaks to a few things. One, it speaks to the quality of our services. Um, when there are opportunities for our clients to renew, we have 100% renewal, renewal rate on those opportunities across our business. Yeah. Um, secondly, it's about making the ask. You know, if you were happy with your services, you know, let's please refer us to someone that is you know at another organization that may need similar services. And thirdly, of course, they know that we're not the company that has a, a bunch of packages on our website that just says we offer the same thing for 10.99 a month, but we offer bespoke engagement. So as a client needs an opportunity, they have a challenge. You know, my biggest question that I always ask is, you know, what are you facing? What challenges are you experiencing in real time? I'm going to give you an answer. And I believe that the, the, the answer is always free. It's the execution that we charge for. But so that that's where we've been. Now where we're at is we're, we've taken a lot of that data to understand from what's been successful, who is our ICP, our ideal customer profile. And we're really beginning to shape uh, some outbound strategies to find them on LinkedIn, find them on email, and be in front of them at events that they may be at. Um, I think, again, when it comes back to referrals, let me be, add a note there. But before 2022, it was referrals and my stage um, experiences. So if I'm on a stage at a conference in Dallas with 10,000 people, that meet and greet line, I'm going to find one or two customers. And typically, sure. those have been the big fish, the AT&T, the Fords, the Disney's, et cetera, over the course of our business. So referrals, you know, being on the right stages, but now we're looking at some of that intentional outbound to get in front of them digitally, but also get in front of them physically uh, from a space of strategy. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. It, the referral speaks volumes, all right? As you and I have talked about my business, 98% uh, of our business comes in from referrals. And obviously, you know, uh, for those who don't know, I'm I'm Jalen and I are working on some things here with, with my company to do to see how we can even increase those referrals, right? And how we can stay in front of clients and prospects and refer partners more uh, regularly. Uh, and so, it, yeah, referrals is where it's at. If, if you can get it to where you're getting a lot of referrals, then, you know, you've got a pretty, pretty solid business. But yeah, the outbound piece is a big part of the, uh, of the world today, especially digital, right? And obviously that's what you and I have been discussing and talking about. Um, I can remember my first job out of college working for ADP and it was, Thursday mornings at eight o'clock till noon, you were sitting behind a phone and you had a piece of paper and you were dialing for dollars, as we called it. We were <laughs> dialing for dollars. And uh, those days for me are long gone and I have no desire to go back. But it's uh, as my dad would say, it's working smarter, not harder. Um, and that's, Absolutely. that's that's what some of these tools are, are out there for, for sure. So, you know, I'm curious if you, if you look back at your career, which is still just blooming. Um 
What would you say has been some, some of the most valuable lessons you've learned from the time you started this at 11 to where you're at now? What's, you know, something that would, most people wouldn't realize, but uh, maybe a valuable lesson that you've learned. If I had to break it down into a single sentence, it would, it would be hard, but I can give two, two areas of, of lessons that I've learned. I had a call this morning with a, a classmate of mine from high school who's now in the, in the middle of a series A round and we're talking and I'm like, one of my biggest experiences or lessons, uh, outcomes that I'm, 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 I'm proud about is not how much we've made or how much we've done, but our ability as an organization to build leaders um, so that I can go launch a new company, build up a team and, and put someone in my place and move on to the next project. And so I think the commitment as an executive, as a leader, as a founder to build big people and to be secure in yourself that if you build big people, they won't replace you, they'll replace the function that you have so that you can grow and move to the next thing and the next opportunity. So that's a major one. Yeah, for sure. Secondly, secondly, I would say it's it's about, okay, so there's this common idea of like, go be a specialist. And specialists are great to hire. The best executive is a generalist. And the idea that they know what it means to lead people, going back to that last point, how to lead and build big people. And so when I look at my my life, at one point I was a specialist in tech, but in reality, the websites I built, Brian, were horrible. <laughs> I was great at selling people on them. And then I realized really quickly without, before getting any complaints, okay, great. I like this. I can go get deals. Let me go get someone to build the websites for me as a contractor and I'll focus on the sales. And as I've grown this business, it really has become, okay, great. I know what's happening in our tech business. I know what's happening in our marketing business. I know what's happening in our, our, our management business. I know what's happening in our real estate business. I know what's happening in our talent development, entertainment business. I know what's happening in uh, the real estate. I know all of these areas enough to give a great answer on how to, how to replicate or how to fix it or how to go in and, and solve problems. However, I'm not the guy programming anymore or I'm not the guy who is in our books anymore, but I also know to the penny, how much we spent yesterday as an organization. And so I think this idea for me, it's as you become a leader, the the need to become more of a generalist grows. And it's important to, to take advantage of being a generalist as long as you can build teams of specialists to execute what you need as an organization. Yeah, absolutely. And when you were talking about Almost, you know, when I when you're talking about, you know, you becoming a generalist and you becoming um, the person who really oversees it and hiring people and training them and developing them to be the person who really runs it uh, so that you can work on the business and not in the business, which is what I tell people clients all day long, right? You didn't, you didn't start this business to process payroll and to, you know, do background checks and to make sure your employees are getting benefit. Like you didn't start the business for that, right? Like focus on what's making you money and get rid of the stuff that doesn't make you any money. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think what's so interesting about you making that comment is there's so many CEOs that are probably listening to this episode right now, or who are out there who are like, I'm in the business. How do I get out of the business? How do I run, you know, how do I not have to be here every single day so that this, this organization runs? And when you can figure that out, your business becomes that much more valuable to a buyer because somebody wants to buy the business, but they don't necessarily want to buy you, right? It, it, it's, it, it can be a, a variety of different things. And so um, I think that's probably one of the key things uh, for, from my, you know, career is, if if a business owner can figure out how to, you know, not be in it, but work, you know, work on it, not in it. Uh, I think that's a, a huge success for them. So I would, that I, I would agree with you on that valuable lesson. It's, it's probably developed Absolutely. for you for over time. And, and I think the the number one, the first step I would take, if you're asking yourself that question, and this is the first assignment I give to any of our founders and our founder circle program. So we have a consulting project, uh, a program and product for founders in that 500 to $5 million range of business a year to help them scale and solve some of those, those scaling difficulties. And one of those things is like, hey, the first assignment is do a production log of what you do in a week. So every time you do a task and every time you spend time on that task, write it down in Ever Hour, Asana, on an Excel sheet to understand what you're actually doing. Because often executives don't know what they're doing or a founder doesn't know what they're doing until they write it down and understand how they can take this item and give it to someone else. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Jalen, I always end my podcast by asking my guests to leave us with a piece of advice. And so that could be on personal life or business. If there was a piece of advice you could leave us with today, what would it be? 
focus on focus on your legacy of impact. I think it's simply that, you know, making money is great and you you need some level of money to, to, to broaden the impact. But if you focus on how do I impact people with my time, with my talent or my treasure, the return on that investment in your life, in your business, with your family is immeasurable. So that's yeah, what I would say to. to no, I, I think that's incredible advice. I think um, I'll just speak personally here. I think everybody is always trying to chase the dollar, right? Well, if I just can make this amount of money, life would be so much better or whatever the case may be is. And the other morning I was on my way to the office and I was listening to Bobby Bones, uh, 93.7, the bull country music for anybody who likes country music. And he was doing this thing where he says, it's called, tell me something good. And there was a story out there of this woman. And I don't remember what state she was in, but uh, she was a homeless person. She was in, sitting outside of a dollar, dollar store or dollar general or something. And this young kid rode their bike uh, to this do store, parked their bike, went inside to get something. And this homeless woman saw somebody come steal uh, this young child's bike. And so this homeless woman who obviously does not have enough money to go buy a home or she you know, doesn't have a job or, or anything along those lines, took what money she did have in her pocket, uh, went into the same store, whatever it was, bought a bike for that child and gave that to that child so that he had a bike when he came out of that store. And when I was listening to that story, I thought to myself, you know, here I am chasing every dollar I can possibly chase, you know, to try to provide for me and my wife, my kids and, and my family. And sometimes I just need to take a step back and think about the kids who are out there who don't even, or don't even have that opportunity or the people that are in my position who are, you know, they're, they're living paycheck by chip paycheck. And uh, it was a kind of an eye opener for me that, you know, I need to, I need to start really giving back more than what I'm doing, doing currently. And because if a homeless person and wherever they were at can find out, figure out a way to go buy this little kid a bike so that he can, you know, still enjoy his young childhood, then by God, I, I should be able to do the same thing, if not more. Right. And I think going back to our earlier statement in the middle of this podcast, where we talked about being a mentor and helping people, I think if we all can just be a better person, a better human, this world would be a lot better place. And I think sometimes we're a little too selfish in our own rights to, um, to really, to get out of, out of our own way to help others. And I, so I think, you know, the overall th theme that I can think about this episode, which has been a great episode is just trying to help others and, and taking your selfless, your selfishness out of, out of the equation. Um, and so to your piece of advice, I think that's so important. And I just uh, appreciate you taking the time today to come on and tell us your story. Um, you're an amazing STL leader. Uh, I was so excited to meet you a few weeks ago and, and, Never didn't, you know, as, as you didn't know, I didn't know where it would go, but, um, I'm glad to call you a friend and I'm, I'm glad you're in a great STL leader. Oh, thank you so much, Brian. We'll have to go ride uh, bikes, motorcycles one of these days and yeah. catch a good sunset or a good ride here in St. Louis. But thank you so much for, for having me on. I'm excited about uh, what you're doing with this podcast and in the, com in the community. Um, I think as you speak to leaders, uh, leaders have influence to make changes across their communities. And so that impact by itself is significant. Absolutely. So thank you. Absolutely. Jim. Have a great day. You as well.